Who is missing out? Where are the barriers? And you don't need to be the expert. Invite those experts in. We try and reinforce that strength is understanding what you're feeling inside and trying to get it out in a healthy way. If I don't understand what a lived experience is, I have to listen to people with that lived experience. Part of taking an intersectional approach means that we address other forms of discrimination and disadvantage beyond just gender. And that's really important because we know that sometimes gender isn't actually the biggest factor involved in um, the violence that women are experiencing. When I think about intersectionality, I think about how important it is to remember both the big structures that we're talking about, like gender, race, and class, and all of those things. We need to think about how those things overlap and interact and we need to remember the individuals as well. What I really love about Change the Story is the intersectional approach that's embedded throughout around intersecting forms of oppression or discrimination, but it's also thinking about intersecting forms of power and privilege. You know, when we're thinking intersectionally in this work, is whose voice or whose take on the issue have you missed out on? Where is the other side of this man's story. It's really important that we are thinking about the complexity of men and boys' lives. And if I don't centralise their experience, acknowledge and validate, and not just, oh yeah, that's hard for you, now why are you using male privilege? Actually really understand that that person's experienced their own oppression and create space for that to be discussed. My denial of those experiences would be re-traumatising, would be re-oppressing them. Where you feel heard, where you feel respected, where you feel represented there, that your culture and your values are celebrated. And often that means making sure that the voices of those communities are very involved in the work, that the work is community-led. Ensure people are thinking outside maybe their own lived experience and bringing in people from other lived experiences. We can't look in on the experience of another community and truly understand it. That's just not how these things work. But we can listen, we can connect, and we can talk with each other. We provide a, from an Aboriginal perspective, a culturally safe and a culturally intuitive response. Who is missing out? Where are the barriers? And you don't need to be the expert. Invite those experts in. A gender transformative approach seeks to break down and challenge those rigid ideas that we have around sex, gender and sexuality. I guess the best way that I describe a gender transformative approach is that it says gender and transformation. So it's not just men that are transforming outdated norms and ideas. This is all of us. The majority of the Australian population, both men and women, are really open to ideas around transforming masculine norms and stereotypes. For many men, there's a very um, strong box about what makes them them, and also what makes a woman a woman. And that really erases the experience of anyone who falls outside of those categories. But it's been so normalized that undoing that is what feels destructive, because it's like tearing down the makeup of what we understand to be true and real. We know that society operates uh, around you know, the categories of male and female and therefore masculinity and femininity. But it's important to think about how we can challenge the binary thinking and binary categories in this work, because it doesn't actually explain or include the diverse experiences of everyone. I try and use personal stories, workplace stories, sports stories, real life stories that hopefully they can relate to that, that kind of transforms their own individual attitudes and behaviours, men, women, boys, girls, gender diverse people. We not only show people who they can relate to, but we actually show women in a variety of different roles, women in leadership, women as doctors, women as firefighters. I sat down with every male that I had to go facilitate with and say, I believe your role in this space is to pick up on all the misogyny and challenge it. I'll deliver the content and I'll do all the stuff that requires authority because that's how we reverse the stereotypes and that's how we challenge people's perceptions. Like we're missing out. Can you imagine if all the butterflies were red? Like, can you, you know, can you imagine if we just saw roses and there was no other flower type? I mean, they're beautiful in their own way, but, but the beauty really is in a diversity. That's what we mean by gender transformative, to move beyond gender where freedom and joy 
and connection and love and respect are the things that define who we are, not these rigid ideas about what makes a man or what makes a woman a woman. The best way to have a strength-based approach is to see people as capable, to see that whatever lived experience they've had has helped them to build a resilience you might not have. That strength-based is about knowing a whole person and going, we're looking to the positives, we're looking to the solutions, where we understand the way that their journey has informed their ideologies and perhaps like you know their perceptions of what like you know gender roles are like here in Australia. Strength-based approaches also means that we might look at all the great attitudes and behaviours that men and boys are already displaying and we might use male role models you know to engage men and boys in this work to, to really um, present alternatives for how men and boys can be. We're told as young people that to be strong is to use our fists to sort out our problems. But we try and reinforce that strength is understanding what you're feeling inside and trying to get it out in a healthy way that's not going to impact you or the others around you. You know, trying to move men out of that logical space and into a more emotional and empathic space. Maintaining accountability to women means firstly, that we are listening to women and to a diverse range of women. A couple of women don't represent all women and they certainly don't represent all abilities or skills or all, you know, culturally and racially and linguistically diverse components of everything. Now there are a number of ways from a cultural perspective that we can bring the women's voice in, that we can bring their stories to tell to the men, to get them to reflect, to understand what they are doing. Women of colour, migrant and refugee women, trans women, and people who are all of those things, women with disabilities, older women, girls, they all have different experiences and we need to be remembering and listening and talking and adjusting what we're doing. Accountability means being willing and open to changing our approach as we go. It's about men being proactive. Like I do hear men who get it more, you know, who seem to really be on board with this, have listened to women without judgment, have listened to women openly, have read, what women are saying, watched what women are saying. If I don't understand what a lived experience is, I have to listen to people with that lived experience. It's the only way I can understand it. It means that we include their voices in the work that we are doing with men and boys in prevention. And there could be various ways uh, that we do that. That could be incorporating feminist approaches into the work. It can be closely consulting with women, ensuring that the work is led by women because oftentimes when we talk about violence against women, it can be lost on young men, right? The only place you see it is on the movies or on TV, but when we bring it a little bit closer, it clicks. Men have to be on the front foot with this one and they have to create a, a culture around them that, that lets their colleagues, especially women and especially gender diverse colleagues, feel safe to give them feedback, to feel like feedback is wanted and invited to show that men are committed to reflective practice. Education with individuals can be a part of it for sure, but it needs to be broader than that. It really needs to be about working with leaders. It needs to be about changing policies, practices to really achieve long-term sustained gender equality. It's really important in primary prevention work that we're looking at the whole of society. If we do our work just with individual men and we stay at that individual level, it's not going to be as impactful because we know that that man goes out into the world, goes to university, goes to the workplace, goes to the sports club, and those ideas of gender are circulating everywhere. Where do those structures and drivers manifest there? And where are the things that are already there that also promote respect that also promote connection, that, that take us in the opposite direction and strengthen those things. It's there in the statement, whole of. Whole of for your organisation, whole of for your community, your project, whatever is the focus, you need to think about it ecologically. Where else does it ricochet off to? So we really need to look at a systemic level where we're getting into not just like workplaces, but other male dominated industries like sporting clubs there, but then also addressing other systemic issues that have an impact on the gender drivers of family violence. Whenever we talk about masculinities, we're talking about primary prevention itself. We need to be thinking big to achieve this change. 
and we have more at our fingertips than ever before to help make this possible. We have more knowledge, we have more understanding, more connections, more technology and more sophisticated techniques. So it's really important that we are addressing those gender drivers, addressing those gendered norms and other social norms at all of those places uh, where a man lives, works and plays.